Her project is on cognitive bias. You've been hearing a lot about that over the last day or two. Um, and she's using it as a measure of welfare and personality in the domestic dog. Her PhD has also covered such diverse areas as cognition, effective state, behaviour and welfare. So, but today she's going to be talking about this cognitive bias story, canine personality, welfare and the significance of this study um, for operant conditioning and training. Thanks, Take it Paul. away, Mel. <laughs> All right, so after that lovely introduction, um, this slide seems redundant, so I'll just um, go straight into this. So first of all, you're probably all wondering what a cognitive bias actually is. And uh, it's really known from the human psychology literature uh, that it's considered a repeatable pattern of distorted perception or inaccurate judgment. So what that means is basically these are biases that everybody has and they're very predictable because everybody shows the same sort of biases in the same sort of situations. And why this is important for animal research is that some cognitive biases are influenced by emotional states. And such biases are known to affect a range of cognitive processes, and I've listed those there at the bottom. And they affect these processes in a range of ways, but the underlying theme is that positive emotional states lead to positive biases and negative emotional states to negative biases. So to highlight the most relevant example, expectation biases, or as I think um, Jay called it, judgment bias, it's the same thing, um, they may be considered as optimism and pessimism and refer to how current emotional state may influence whether we expect more positive outcomes or negative outcomes. So if life has been treating us quite well lately, we expect that, that um, glass is half full and if life hasn't been treating us so great, then the glass is half empty. So expectation biases, or judgment biases, as it's sometimes called, have been studied in a variety of species, and in some species it's been validated as an indicator of emotional state. So it was first tested in rats by Harding et al. in 2004, and it's since been investigated in a whole range of species, and it's been found in all of the species that I've listed there. So even including honeybees. So this is quite uh, extensive, and as far as we know, every animal shows it. <laughs> and I mean, this is... Important because um, if we know that cognitive biases are influenced by emotional state, then if we can measure cognitive biases in animals, then we can infer what their emotional state might be. So measuring cognitive biases in animals is a little bit convoluted, but it boils down to three major components. The first component is a signal, and we, or two signals as it, as it happens. We need a signal that predicts a positive outcome and a signal that predicts a negative outcome for the animal. And the second component is the outcomes themselves. So in my study, I had a positive signal, which was a auditory tone, and it was associated with a lactose-free milk reward, and that was my positive outcome. And the negative signal was a different tone, and it was associated with uh, water being delivered instead of milk. And that was the negative or neutral outcome. And then we need a response from the animal that would tell us how they've interpreted the signal that we've given them. And most studies use a go or no-go approach, so the animal has to perform something in order to get their positive outcome and abstain from <coughs> performing it to avoid a negative outcome. Uh, so this is the fancy apparatus that I built, which automatically trains and tests a dog's cognitive bias. I'm very excited about it, but <laughs> it doesn't look that exciting from the photo. Uh, but it's got a target. You can see at the front where that black dot is. That whole section is, a, is basically a target. And there's a photo interrupter in front of it, which is made up of an infrared beam. So when the dog moves their nose towards the target, they break that beam, and that would trigger either milk or water to be delivered into the trays at the front, depending on which signal they got. So the dogs ultimately learn to touch the target after their milk signal to get their milk reward and abstain from touching after their water signal to avoid getting water. And once they're doing that, and we can see that there's a definite difference in how they're responding to the tones, we can test their cognitive bias by introducing unreinforced probe tones, as they're called. And they're ambiguous tones that are somewhere between the milk and water tone that we've already trained them to understand. And we measure how quickly they respond to those tones, and that would tell us whether they've interpreted the ambiguous tones as a positive or a negative tone. So theoretically, we can figure out exactly how optimistic or pessimistic the dog is by where on the scale they start to treat signals as negative rather than positive. 
So if we give them a signal that's close to water and they respond to it very quickly, that we would assume that they've interpreted that as a positive signal rather than a negative signal. And that would indicate that they're optimistic because they're treating signals that are like negative signals as if they were positive signals. And uh, on the other side, if, they, if we give them a signal that's close to milk and they don't respond at all, then we would consider them pessimistic. Oh, and this is a video just to show you. I hope that if I can just click it. Uh, this is a video of the cognitive bias test in progress. It doesn't have any sound, but it's got captions. So he just heard a water tone and the dog just walked away and stared at the door. <laughs> So that was an ambiguous tone, and he had a look and just went, not going to keep staring at the door. But when he heard his milk tone, he raced over there, and he got a milk reward. He did this quite a lot too, just staring at the target. And he heard a probe, but he just froze, and he didn't touch the target. He just stared at that instead. So he was quite good at staring at things, this dog. Uh, so these are the results from six dogs in my study, so each graph is a different dog. Uh, you can't see it all that well, but what I want you to focus on is the red line, which is the average latency, or the, the time it takes for the dogs to touch the target after hearing a tone. And along the x-axis is the tone, so towards the left is the milk tone, and then the, the water tone is far right. So we should expect to see that red line low at the start and high at the end. And we can see that in, in most of them, <laughs> but um, what I really want you to look at is just how different these graphs are, because some of these dogs were brought up in a similar environment and they're being kept in the, in the kennel situation, so they're all getting uh, much the same management and they're getting the same training from the same sort of people and the same food. So all their sort of conditions are very similar, yet the responses to this is so different. So that kind of suggests to us that there may be a strong personality component in cognitive bias. So my project has, has a number of potential uh, applications, and the first is obviously a possible objective assessment of welfare, which is um, what cognitive bias is kind of being used as at the moment, or what we're developing it as. But with this possible personality aspects, aspect, it may also be possible to use it to identify individuals that may be prone to behavioural problems or good candidates for demanding training programs, like this search and rescue dog here. If we know how optimistic or pessimistic a really good working dog is for a particular job, then we can, we can test for that at an early stage and, and perhaps use that as a selection criteria. And it may also aid in predicting behaviour, which could be useful for a number of situations, but um, could be quite useful in training. So how might recognising emotional states in dogs help us to train them? That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> so no one jumped to answer or anything. <laughs> so we already know that uh, emotional states influence how dogs interpret ambiguous signals. So negative emotional states may promote risk aversion in training, and Jade touched on this a little bit as well, but I'll go into it in a bit more detail. And we may also see that positive emotional states promote confidence and optimism in training. So if we have a pessimistic dog in training, we may find that they're not really interested in, in trying new things, which is probably going to hurt our training a little bit. But if we have a very optimistic dog in training, we may find that they're quite happy to try new things. In fact, they like it, so that's probably useful for us in training. So you might imagine that operant conditioning can also influence emotional states. So if we imagine that repeated punishment could be considered uh, repeated aversive experiences, which we'd expect would lead to pessimism. And conversely, repeated reinforcement may lead to optimism. So choosing operant conditioning approaches that provide positive experiences may be beneficial in training by creating positive moods. So it's commonly held that there are two aspects to emotional state. And the first is emotional valence, which is what I've been talking about so far with cognitive bias. And that's how positive or negative the emotional experience is. And the other component is arousal. And that refers to attentional and physiological changes related to a state of alertness. 
So the Yerkes Dodson Law from the early 1900s, it describes the relationship between arousal and performance. And this graphic here shows what's known as the Yerkes and Dodson inverted U-shape. And the, this is based on findings that there may be a peak level of optim, a, a peak level of arousal, sorry, depending on the the behaviour that is that. Oh. Well, the, as, a, as a target behavior. So there should be, if we imagine that um, at low arousal, a dog may not be motivated enough or interested enough to perform reliably, but at very high arousal, their performance may be uh, impaired by either strong anxiety or a lack of precision or um, just, yeah, if we need them to think, we need their arousal to be a little bit lower, like in that, in that middle zone. So this re relationship doesn't necessarily hold for all behaviours. It holds for difficult behaviours or moderately difficult behaviours. But if the behaviour is very easy, then it'll be a more linear relationship. So if you imagine greyhounds racing, um, performance probably is going to increase with arousal. Thank you. Uh, so this figure comes from a paper by Mendel et al. And it shows how arousal and emotional valence may combine to produce general moods. So you can see arousal is on the y-axis. Uh, low at the bottom through to high at the top, and on the x-axis is emotional valence, positive at the left and negative. Oh, negative on the left and <laughs> positive on the right. So if we imagine that if we have a dog that their arousal is very high, but their valence is very positive, then we're looking at an excited, happy kind of dog. But if their arousal is still very high, but their valence is negative, then um, we're looking at a fearful or anxious or kind of panicky dog. So you can imagine that these axes kind of can be independent to each other and we can move up and down arousal while valence is the same and we can move up backwards and forwards on valence while arousal is the same. So I wrote a paper last year which was published at the start of this year and it's available free online. And I developed 3D graphs called response landscapes in this paper, and that shows how an animal may, may respond to different operant conditioning approaches depending on both their arousal and their current emotional state or emotional valence. So the response landscapes are likely to change depending on the behaviour being trained and the equipment available to train it. So at the moment this is purely th theoretical and there's no direct data, but the predictions are based on current literature. And they're not to say which quadrant to use when. I'm really going to stress that now. But they're really supposed to illustrate how training um, outcomes may be achieved by starting with the dog in an ideal place on the emotional valence and arousal landscape. So there are a few basic principles underpinning the landscapes, and I'm going to use this slide <coughs> to uh, describe those. This is a response landscape for training a dog to heal off leash and it's been broken into four sections so you can see each operant conditioning quadrant on its own. So if we look at the bottom two first, that's negative punishment is the orange one and positive punishment is the green one. So what you'll notice at first is that um, the effectiveness which is the likelihood of getting the desired behaviour is shown on the y-axis and that's quite low in the, both those graphs particularly where arousal which is along that side <laughs> going that way, arousal is low and emotional valence, which is the one going up, is also low. And that's based on this idea that, um, that dogs in this state may be easily discouraged with aversive experiences. So we would predict that pessimistic dogs are likely to be sensitive to aversive experiences and if they receive them in the form of punishment, that, they may, that may push them further into a negative mood and getting them to behave at all may be quite difficult. They're probably going to shut down a little bit. But you can see with these ones that at high arousal, where emotional state is very positive, they kind of come up a little bit. And uh, that's based on the prediction that um, when dogs are very optimistic and very excited, they may become experts at finding reinforcements, and they're not necessarily reinforcements that we can control. So. And they also are likely to be quite resilient to aversive experiences, so that's a little bit protective, perhaps. So I think that wraps up those ones. If we look up at the top graphs, the red one is positive reinforcement and the blue one is negative reinforcement. So at low arousal, again, we kind of see a little bit of um, the issues with 
For Yerkes Dodson law, so we'll have motivation hampering our training effects, and that's also present at very high arousal. So these graphs, you can kind of see that little hump that is the Yerkes Dodson inverted U shape. So, and also where emotional state is negative, we would predict that dogs would be more interested in avoiding aversive experiences than obtaining access to reinforcers. So in that situation, we might find negative reinforcement might be more effective than otherwise it would be. And I think that's, I might just, sh I'll switch to this computer and I'll show you, oh, what do we do here? I'll show you the response landscapes in their 3D form, hopefully. Yes? No? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So you can get these graphs online. Oh, I was kind of hoping this would be smaller and less like pixelated, but oh well. <laughs> so this is, um, this is a response landscape for training tracking in dogs. So um, you can kind of see that we have a lot of red, which is positive reinforcement. I'll remind you of that. And we can kind of see a little bit of that Yerkes Dodson hump through there where arousal is moderate, that's arousal down there. And we see negative reinforcement popping up here where arousal is low and emotional state is negative. And that again speaks to that idea that the dog may, be, may actually need re negative reinforcement as some sort of um, motivation. Which of course is not to say that you know, if a dog is in that state we should, that's what we should do. We might actually be better, better served by getting the dog in here somewhere where um, generally we're more likely to get the behaviour that we want, but um, with, particularly with, with positive reinforcement. And you can also see these negative ones, the, the negative punishment and positive punishment are similar to the, the healing on leash graphs. Ooh, isn't that fun? <laughs> Whee! <laughs> All right, so <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> Uh, this one is healing on leash. And so you can see this one, I'll just quickly scroll down to this one which is healing off leash. So this is the one that I showed you in the slide broken up. And what I want you to see with these ones is that if we ignore these little blue lumps, um, the rest of the, the graph looks quite similar. And that's because the behaviour is pretty much the same, but the difference is that with negative reinforcement, in this condition where we're training a dog to heal on leash, um, we have the ability to use a leash, which automatically means that negative reinforcement is probably a little bit easier to use than it would otherwise be. And um, probably people are a little bit tempted to use it a lot, to be honest. And you can see that this is, it's not really so much that the negative reinforcement is popping up. <laughs> it's just that that negative reinforcement layer in general is a bit higher in, uh, in this graph, so where that Yerkes Dodson hump is, it's sort of coming out on each side of that. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> and this last one that I'm just going to have a quick look at because it's very different. <coughs> this is um, training a stay. I can't quite make this, maybe I can make this smaller. Here we go, that's a bit better, maybe smaller again. So the reason why this one is very different to the others is because stay is a stationary behaviour. So um, we can, uh, this might be a little bit controversial, but we can imagine that if um, arousal is low, so we have a dog that's not really interested in moving around much in the first place, and then we punish that dog, uh, we may find that we get a stay, because a stay is basically no behaviour, isn't it? So um, every time the dog moves or does anything and we punish it very quickly, they'll just not bother. <laughs> but that may not hold so much when um, effective state or emo emotional valence is higher and where arousal is higher because their priorities are different. But it probably does still hold where emotional state is low. It doesn't really, oh yeah, it does show that, that's it, that, that's that there. So that one's kind of pretty. I'll um, flip back to that other computer for the end of the talk. Oh, good, one minute. Excellent. <laughs> okay, in turn.
So my hope is that visualizing how emotional state and arousal may influence training with operant conditioning will help people identify the optimal arousal and emotional valence for a given behavior that they are trying to train. And in that way, they could optimize their they could optimise their dog's performance and their training efficiency because they're already kind of starting with a dog that's in the perfect situation or in the perfect state for learning that behaviour. And it may also be good with troubleshooting because when training is not going so well, uh, encouraging trainers to consider why that may be from an emotional and arousal perspective may help them to correctly identify what is going wrong and then successfully address that. So thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to quickly acknowledge Black Dog Wear and Positive Puppies for financial uh, support. Positive Puppies and Assistance Dogs Australia and actually Security Home Solutions should be on there as well for access to dogs. Tim Starling, my brother, for helping me build the apparatus and my supervisors, of course, Paul and Nick. And Dennis Cody for analysis. Peter Thompson, friends and family. My dogs, everyone. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>